Hello there, I'm Tyler Griffin, and this is Scripture Study Insights by Scripture Central. Today, 2 Nephi chapters 31 through 33. And I'm excited to have my wife, Kiplin, join me for the second half of this episode. So we're going to finish off this incredible uh, book of 2 Nephi and say farewell to uh, a person who has become one of my my best friends through life. I love Nephi for what he, he taught us through his life and through his writings and how, how well he embodies the principles of the gospel and points us to Christ. So, as we open up chapter 31, we'll introduce kind of the overlay that I wanted to use as our scripture study look for, our technique, our principle today. He says in verse 1, Now I, Nephi, make an end of my prophesying unto you, my beloved brethren. Because remember, in 26, 27, 28, he's been giving all these prophecies in 29 of what would happen in the future from his time period. And he says, And I cannot write but a few things which I, which I know must surely come to pass. Neither can I write but a few of the words of my brother Jacob. Wherefore, the things which I have written sufficeth me, save it be a few words which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. This is beautiful because he sets the stage saying, I- I'm not going to do a-, a lot of prophesying or telling of things to come. I've-, I've finished that and it sufficeth me. I can't write everything. But I want to finish, of all the things Nephi could tell us about, where does he end his record in his last three chapters? He ends it talking about the doctrine of Christ. Now, here's the, here's the overlay principle for today. President uh, Boyd K. Packer once taught, and I love, this is my favorite quote from him, true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behaviors. A study of the doctrines of the gospel will change behavior quicker then a study of behavior will change behavior. He's, he's setting up this foundational hierarchy, if you will, that your understanding and your underlying beliefs in true doctrines, true principles of the gospel, sets up your behaviors. And if we focus on changing people's behaviors rather than helping them understand the gospel, it's possible. We see examples in the scriptures of where you can force behavioral changes, but they usually don't last. And so it's a powerful principle of the gospel as a learner, as a parent, as a teacher, as a leader to identify what are the behaviors that we notice in ourselves or in those we're leading or or raising as parents that might need some adjustments and instead of putting the full focus on those behaviors, seeking the help of the Holy Ghost, turning to God to find out what might some of the doctrinal underpinnings be that we could do a, uh, use more effort in teaching those correct principles and those doctrines that would then lead to better behaviors down the road and not expect instantaneous results, but expect that this is going to be a process more likely than an event. So I love watching Nephi unfold this doctrine. And by the way, he gives us this beautiful bookend technique in chapters 31 and 32. In in biblical scholarship, they call this inclusio where you start by saying something, in this case, I'm going to talk about the doctrine of Christ, and then you close it off. So in verse 21, at the very end of the chapter, he says, this is the doctrine of Christ. So now you know between those two bookends, you have the doctrine of Christ. In this case, he extends the the bookend one more time in chapter 32, verse 6. Behold, this is the doctrine of Christ. And then he adds this beautiful caveat there will be no more doctrine given until after he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh. So, as he's expounding on these doctrines, he's saying, this is the core. 
these are the core doctrines and there there might be other layers in a bullseye of principles and doctrines and teachings of the church but he's saying x marks the spot these are the core doctrines this is the, the doctrine of christ and when he manifests himself unto you in the flesh which for most of the the people in in the new world that will be in third nephi and in the latter days that's when he restores the gospel through joseph smith the prophet and gives additional principles of the gospel adding to that but those are coming from him not from the philosophies of the world or from the scholars or from any of the opinions that might exist horizontally so it's this beautiful principle of stay focused on the core element or elements of the gospel the doctrine and what's what's nice when you're in scripture study mode is to look for triangulation to look for other places just to cross verify that what you're reading is that, that you're understanding that doctrine that you're understanding that teaching appropriately and gratefully we have a variety of places in the scriptures where you can see the definitions of things like the doctrine of Christ in 2 Nephi 31 through 32, in 3 Nephi 11, verse 32 through 39. At the end of 3 Nephi 11, in verse 32 through 39, this is where Jesus himself gives his own definition of what his doctrine is, and he uses the exact same technique of those bookends or the inclusio where he says in verse 32 this is my doctrine and then he gives you some statements and then in verse 39 he says this is my doctrine so it's kind of an open quote quote close quote kind of an idea then you get his definitions of the gospel in 3 Nephi 27 13 through 21 and doctrine and covenants section 76 40 through 42. So if you want to dig a little deeper this week into your study of what is the doctrine and what is the gospel, and it's fun to do some, some Venn diagram cross comparisons between these lists of definitions. Uh, it's beautiful to see how much the Savior's mission, his willingness to come down and do the will of the Father and to be lifted up by men and to be slain for the sins of the world, uh, his atoning sacrifice are front and center in the definitions of the gospel. The doctrine seems to focus a lot more on what he is willing to help us accomplish and become in our life. So it's just a fun little opportunity for you to, to uh, explore in your scripture study other aspects of, of what is at the core of those principles and doctrines that we need to understand. So, here we have these elements of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in this case, the doctrines of Christ. You have faith in the Savior. You're willing to repent of your sins. You enter into the gate of baptism um, through repentance, and you receive that gift of the Holy Ghost, and Heavenly Father adds, if you endure to the end, the same shall be saved. All these beautiful principles and ordinances of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ are at the core of all of the other things we can focus on in the church. In the Book of Mormon Insights video that Taylor Halverson and I did four years ago, we walk through the, the beautiful symbolic overlay of the doctrine of Christ contained here in chapters 31 and 32, seen through the lens of a walkthrough of the ancient tabernacle or of the temple at the time of Jesus with the outer gate the altar of sacrifice, the laver, entering into the holy place with the menorah, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread before the veil in that holy place, and then entering into the veil eventually into the Holy of Holies. I won't take the time to go through that here, but if you want to um, explore that particular avenue of looking at chapter 31, that's in the video that was produced four years ago. Moving on here, 
I love that he says, verse 17, wherefore do the things which I have told you I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. Are you noticing the pattern? Nephi is encouraging these behaviors. He's not just saying, I want you to sit back and believe. He's saying, no, you, you follow Jesus Christ, and he said it in a variety of ways. The Lord himself, through Nephi's scribal efforts, has told us the same thing. We need to do these things. For for this cause have they been shown unto you that you might know the gate by which you should enter. For the gate by which you should enter is repentance and baptism by water. And then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. I love the fact that he says that the gate is not just baptism, it's repentance and baptism. So your faith in Christ brings you to repent and to be baptized. That's the gate you enter in, and then cometh the remission of your sins. Your sins aren't washed away just by the water, they're purged by the baptism of fire, by the Holy Ghost. And then are ye in this straight and narrow path. This, this is one of the most beautiful manifestations of God's love, this invitation to repent and to be baptized and to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and to walk in that straight and narrow way. I love something that uh, President Jeffrey R. Holland and President Susan Porter have both shared in General Conference. In fact, uh, President Porter was quoting President Jeffrey R. Holland when he said this, the first great commandment of all eternity is to love God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. That's the first great commandment. Now, my favorite part, but the first great truth of all eternity is that God loves us with all of his heart, might, mind, and strength. So, speaking of commandments, speaking of things like the first great commandment, the second great commandment, the commandment to be baptized, the commandment to repent, the commandment to enter in and press forward and endure to the end, all of these commandments, brothers and sisters, if you peel back enough of the layers down at the core, what you find is the Savior Jesus Christ himself. You find Heavenly Father. They loved us with everything they had. So they're not asking us to do something that they weren't willing to first model and show for us what it looks like. Jesus didn't just say, love your neighbor. He showed us what that looks like. He didn't just say, go and get baptized. He showed us what it looks like. He kept the commandment from Heavenly Father to fulfill all righteousness so that he could show us the way. So all of these commandments, all of these opportunities that are given to us to, to try and strive to become more like him are beautiful at the core when we realize it really is an invitation to become more like God. He, he's bringing us closer to God the Father in these, in these examples and in these, these invitations that we call commandments. Now, for this next part, I'm excited to have Kiplan join me. Uh, th this verse 20 is one of the most famous verses of all the scriptures for members of the church. It's incredible. Wherefore, ye must press forward with steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men, Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Doesn't get much better than that, right? No, it doesn't. But um, I have to tell you uh, an experience I had one time reading this scripture. Um, it was perhaps not my finest moment, but um, I was, I was, you know, squeezing my scripture study in that day just amid all the chaos of life, and, and I was reading, and, and it was one of those days, and, and I, I get to 20, I'm like, oh, I recognize this, wherefore you must press forward. Okay, press forward, that's okay, I can do that, with a steadfastness in Christ. And I thought, you know, I, I, I love Jesus, I love the Savior, um, so far so good. Having a perfect bright, and I got to perfect brightness. 
And I was like, oh no, there's that word, that perfect, perfect brightness of hope that I don't know if I have a perfect anything, <laughs> especially not a brightness of hope, uh, maybe especially not today. Um, but I kept going and a love of God and I do love God and of all men. And then it was like, oh no, <laughs> all all men and women and then you start thinking about those people that are just really difficult to get along with and and, and those people that are making your children's life difficult and and I thought mm, this is not looking so good for me and and wherefore if ye shall press forward feasting upon the word and I was like, not, not nibbling, not just, not even reading. Not, can I just study even, but feasting? I was like, no, I don't, I don't think I'm nailing that one today at all either. Um, and endure to the end. Oh, I was exhausted. Just, uh, just one verse in, I was exhausted to my, my scriptures that day. And, uh, and it was honestly quite discouraging. Um, sometimes... I, you know, in our real, messy, muddy, normal lives, um, we're, we're dealing with a lot of things and a lot of pressures and a lot of stresses in relationships, at work, um, with our family members, uh, calling sometimes, juggling, all kinds of things, and life can feel overwhelming. And then on top of that, you add things like... Um, the weight of a mental illness or health challenges or temptation, weakness, unresolved questions and concerns. Uh, and, and it can feel, it can feel like completely overwhelming. Like I can't, I, I, that day I was, I was like, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. Um, and, and as I was sitting there kind of wallowing in this, uh, in this feeling, the thought came into my mind, back up, read, read more. And so I, I flicked my eyes to the top of the column and I just started reading down. Um, and as I was reading through this section that, that Tyler has just been teaching, I came to verse 19, which is right before the verse that was that I was wrestling with. Um, now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, nay. And this was the part, as I got to this part, it was like my soul just kind of breathed this sigh as these words rested on my soul. For ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. And as I read those words, I felt the truth of them, that all this stuff here, all, all this steadfastness and this perfect in Christ and brightness of hope and, and, and feasting and, and loving all, everybody all the time, it wasn't me. I, I'm not good enough to do that. It was all him. It is all him. It's all Jesus. My job is to get myself into a position to rely wholly upon him. And he's the one that does the saving. I am not my own savior. I didn't have to, I didn't have to do all this all by myself. That's the arm of flesh, right? It's Jesus that does that in my life. And so my challenge is to figure out how to rely more fully and wholly upon his merits and his mercy and his grace. And he is the mighty savior. Um, so, so that changes everything based on verse 19. When you get back into that verse 20, that idea that, that you introduced, wherefore ye must press forward, but now you're no longer pressing forward on your own. That isn't the plan. The plan is to press forward with steadfastness in Christ. That was another thing I noticed as I reread that verse. It, it, you'll notice if you want to circle in your scriptures, it's in, in Christ. Steadfastness in Christ, um, not outside of Christ. <laughs> there is no steadfastness in my life 
or yours outside, outside of him because he he is the epitome of steadfast and there is no love in my life that I can give or myself or anyone else outside of Christ it's in Christ that we can love and, and all these other things which, well. which which in essence is is the whole purpose of entering into that covenant relationship with him that I no longer need to do anything in verse 20 alone I can't I can only do it in him because he is the one who teaches me how to perfectly love God. He's the one who teaches me how to perfectly love people. He's the one who endured to the end perfectly. And so he helps me in all of these things. Yeah, in fact, as I went back and read this verse, it kind of read something more like this. Wherefore ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, relying wholly upon Jesus Christ's perfect brightness of hope and Jesus Christ's love of God and of all men and Jesus Christ's ability to help me understand his words and feast on them and be nourished by them and relying wholly upon the Savior's ability to endure to the end. That's what this verse has become to me is it's all about him. It's all about him doing the saving and me having the humility to let him and to recognize my need to rely wholly upon him um, to make these things happen in my life. And where we do the, the bulk of our work is in the trusting and the faith and the pressing forward um, yeah. so that that can all work together. There is this, this sense of in a covenant connection with him, he has done the infinite work of performing the atonement and providing the grace and the mercy and the, the capacity to do all this stuff that he now asks us to do. So he did his part alone and we never have to do our part alone. We rely on him as he helps us learn to do our part. It, it reminds me of this incredible quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, thus, if you have really handed yourself over to Jesus, it must follow that you are trying to obey him, but trying in a new way, a less worried way, not doing these things in order to be saved, but because he has begun to save you already, not hoping to get to heaven as a reward for your actions, but inevitably wanting to act in a certain way because a first faint gleam of heaven is already inside you. And that only happens through the, the mercy and the grace and the merits of Jesus Christ and his atonement as you've been talking. Yeah. Uh, and so, really, we, we don't need to be wound up so tightly all the time. Just relax into his grace a little bit and, and press forward in that grace. I love that. So what might that look like in, in practice, in, in a person's real life? Well, in, in my life, if, if I understand this doctrine that, that it is my job to have faith and trust in the Savior to save me, now that includes from my weaknesses and my, my stupidity and, and my, my ignorance. What that looks like in my life is if I'm sitting with a child and we're having a conversation and I just get, I get a little too involved and I say some things that, that are hurtful um, or that I, I wish I hadn't. My job is not to now beat myself up and, and say, I, I've just, I've got to work harder and I've got to do this by myself and I've got, I just keep doing the same things over and over again. And I keep messing up in the same places and I've just, I've got to be better. I've got to try harder. I've got to work more. I've got to, <laughs> you, you know, that's, yeah. that's not what I need to do. What I need to do, what this looks like in practice for me is when that happens, I immediately turn to the Savior and I say, oh, thou who is mighty to save, please save me. In this situation, it involves repentance. It involves going to the child and asking for forgiveness and it involves clean slates and fresh starts and new beginnings every single day, multiple times a day. It is beautiful when you understand that I'm not relying on my own arm of flesh to do this. 
I am relying wholly upon Jesus' goodness and perfection and, and mightiness to save, it changes everything. Yeah. It changes and, everything. And, and it, it applies in all aspects of our life. You know, if you're asked to give a talk or a lesson or to serve in a calling, and you recognize that it wasn't perfect, it wasn't flawless, the effort you put forth, you don't have to beat yourself up because it's not about a perfect talk or a perfect calling or a perfect activity. It's about inviting people to, to think about, study about, learn about, and connect with the Savior. And if along the way it isn't it isn't exactly the way that you would have wanted it to be somehow, thanks to his merits and his mercy and his grace, it's okay. It's okay. I love this, Kiplin, because it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from President Thomas S. Monson. When he was the second counselor in the First Presidency, this is going way back to 1988 in the Enzyme First Presidency message, the March issue. He, he gave this incredible statement that ties in beautifully with what you've been uh, talking, what we've been talking about here. He says this, God left the world unfinished for man to work his skill upon. He left the electricity in the cloud, the oil in the earth. He left the rivers unbridged and the forests unfelled and the cities unbuilt. God gives to man the challenge of raw materials, not the ease of finished things. He leaves the pictures unpainted and the music unsung and the problems unsolved that man might know the joys and glories of creation. If it's in, in, this, in this covenant path progression, God could do everything for you listed in verse 20. He could just prepackage all of this and say, here, I did this for you. But there's this joy of discovery, of wrestling with those, those situations that you found yourself in on that day, like you did with the scripture study, of creating with the Lord this masterpiece of, of understanding in this case, which built you your foundation of belief on which you could now act with, with a foundation rooted in the rock of your Redeemer, which makes all the difference. Well, I was thinking about that, the, the scripture study um, insight or overlay that you were talking about earlier was this idea of your, your understanding of correct doctrine affects your, uh, your beliefs, which affects how you act. And um, how does understanding this idea that we do everything we do, not by the strength of our own arm and, and relying on the arm of flesh, but relying wholly upon he who is mighty to save. You know, how, how does a, a true and deep belief in that doctrine affect how we think and how we feel and how we go about our day? It, it makes a big difference for me. It, make, it makes all the difference. It adds, it adds the... The, both the depth, the foundation, as well as the overarching application to everything we're learning. Which brings us into verse 21 where he says, And now, behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. Everything that he just gave you, this is the way. And there is none other way, nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. That's pretty all-encompassing and exclusionary language for any other solution the world or the experts or the philosophies of men may, may uh, try to, to convince us of. He's saying there is no other way nor name given under heaven. It's only in Jesus Christ. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ. Now, that ties us back into the very beginning of the chapter when he told you in verse 2, I'm going to speak a few more words concerning the doctrine of Christ. So now he's, he's bookended this for us to help us see, look, everything in chapter 31, all I've been doing, this is Nephi speaking to us, is giving you the doctrine of Christ. And then he concludes with, 
and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. I love how he's invoking all three members of the Godhead after he sets out the doctrine of Christ. This idea of, you know, faith, repentance, baptism, endure to the end, the the atonement of Jesus Christ encircling that entire process. Um, Jesus Christ himself encircling that entire process. It's beautiful as Nephi, this incredible prophet, one of my one of my biggest heroes as he's finishing this this incredible discourse on the doctrine of Christ to invoke, as you said, all three members of the Godhead as witnesses that this is their doctrine. And then he used that phrase, one God, without end, amen. So there are many people who who get a little bit confused about every time the scriptures refer to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost as being one God. I think it's important to note that the Savior never uses the word same. He he never says, for instance, the Father and I and the Holy Ghost are the same. He never once uses that. He always uses the word one. And there's something profound about the whole mission, the life, the teachings, and the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ. It's all about at one meant. It's bringing things together and combining them. The devil is all about division and separating. Christ is all about bringing together. And it's interesting that this word one, he uses in other places in scripture to refer to other relationships. He he refers to Zion. They were of one heart and one mind. He doesn't say the same heart or the same mind. He refers to a husband and wife relationship to become one, not the same. When you join together in marriage, you don't become the same person, do we, sweetie? <laughs> we don't We don't think the same. We don't come up with the same ideas. We don't Thank always have heaven. the same solutions. It's the coming together and the unifying of those two souls in the marriage and bringing all of your God-given uniqueness to that relationship, but being united in Christ. And so you are separate individuals, but you become one in Christ as he, his arms of mercy and love and power encircle the two of you, encircle the two of you. (laughs) And, and, and you, you take all that he's given you and you move forward with a with a unified vision of where you're going and and where you're trying to get to. So basically this concept becomes enhanced when you look at a marriage, when you look at a family, parent-child relationships, or companionship in a mission, or any relationship that you have in a calling, in a presidency, or with a ministering companion. If you can look at the things in verse 19 and 20, and the whole rest of the doctrine of Christ, if you look at it as these are all these people that the Lord has brought into my life to combine with in a beautiful covenantal way in some cases and in a a calling way in others, but we walk this journey together, but it's all, as you're saying, it's all rooted in Jesus Christ at the center of all of those relationships. That's what he's, what brings the oneness, the unity. There, there is it's no him. true unity outside of him. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I find it interesting that as we carry on, and, and now we're kind of, we're going on this path, um, one of the next concepts that Nephi talks about is the Holy Ghost and speaking with the tongue of angels. I remember Jeffrey R. Holland's beautiful talk um, entitled Tongue of Angels. Um, and that this idea that um, President Nelson actually, in his talk, Peacemakers Needed, talked about how we talk to people and about people and treat people really matters. Um, but this idea of speaking with the tongue of angels, how do we do it? By the power of the Holy Ghost. Um, it just made me think that on this journey, how we treat others 
and how we, we talk to others is part of a disciple's journey on this covenant path. It's part of, of, um, of relying wholly upon the Savior. And, and the Savior puts those words, that tongue of angels in our mouth and allows us to, um, to reflect his kindness and his gentleness and his civility and his respect. I love that. Now, how many of you remember back to, to your childhood in primary or elementary school or when, when, you were, when you were a kid, the show and tell? That was always one of my favorite parts because somebody would bring something and they would show us, and tell us about it. Well, in this case, we get the tell and show. We get the, the opposite order. In, in the bottom of verse 3, Nephi informs us that the words of Christ will tell you the things what you should do. So these words that come in the scriptures and from the living prophets and from inspired people and from our patriarchal blessings and from other blessings that we receive, they will tell us at times the things that we need to do. The problem sometimes comes in, in I, I was told what to do, I just don't know what it actually looks like. So I love that he, he clarifies here in verse 5, he says, For behold, again I say unto you that if you will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what you should do. There's a big difference between somebody telling you what to do and the Holy Ghost making very clear, this is what it looks like for you in that setting, whether it be in a, in a family setting, in a church setting, a mission setting, a work setting, a school setting, the idea being the Holy Ghost will show us those, those applications of these gospel principles. What a beautiful promise. In this next section, he talks about um, prayer. And, and it's the, the scripture we're familiar with, pray always. But it's really interesting <clears throat> what he says. He says, for um, if he would hearken unto the spirit which te teacheth a man to pray, ye would know that ye must pray. But then he kind of um, states the opposite as well. For the evil spirit teacheth not a man to pray, but teacheth him that he must not pray. And I thought that was really interesting. And I thought, why would he, why would he state it that way? Why wouldn't he just state, leave it in the positive? The you positive. should pray. Something important to remember about the devil is that he, he divides and he, he isolates. That's, that's one of his tactics that he uses. And the Savior unites and he connects. Um, so the devil wants to, on a larger scale, backing away from just, just the one uh, principle of prayer, he's trying to cut us off. He's trying to isolate us. He's trying to divide us, sunder us from, from hope and love and light and truth and all those things. And the Savior is trying to connect us with, with sources of light and hope and truth and love. And so prayer becomes like kind of this pivotal hinge point, one of, one of the big ones for the devil to attack. If he can get us, teach us not to pray, what has he accomplished? He's, he's managed to cut us off and isolate us um, in a huge way from, from the Savior, our Heavenly Father's light, knowledge, revelation, um, love. And then once he's got us isolated, like in so many other areas, once he's got us alone and vulnerable, he can fill our mind and heart with the whispering lies of, of hell. And, and we're kind of vulnerable to that because we don't have the, the, the conduit open for, for the antidote. <laughs> uh, and so, so this prayer thing is, is really important. Um, and, and it's a powerful protection against the adversary um, if we learn to pray. In fact, President Nelson said, um, 
our, our prayers can be and should be living discussions with our Heavenly Father. When I, when I think of, a, of life and living things, I think of plants, you know, a little plant growing in the garden. Um, the point being that something that's living is growing, it's becoming, it's, it's, um, it's responsive to, to stimuli such as sunlight and water and fertilizer, and it, it changes um, in positive ways as it grows. And so a living relationship, a living prayer, a living discussion with, with Father in Heaven would, would be this, this growing, enlarging, becoming, responsive experience. Yeah, what you're describing there to me is the embodiment of, of Nephi's words in verse 9. But behold, I say unto you that you must pray always. And I think President Nelson's uh, commentary on, on these living discussions, this, this ongoing connection with God, is this pray always. It doesn't mean you have to constantly be kneeling down and bowing your head and closing your eyes. It's just this ongoing conversation, pray always and not faint that you must not perform anything under the Lord, save in the first place ye shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. So no longer do we go to church just to go to church. We go to church to connect with Christ. And we're praying our way all the way through the preparation, all the way through the experience, and all the way home. That, it, that this can be more than just jumping through a hoop. That it can be this consecrated effort for this, this connecting point with Christ. Now we come to chapter 33, where Nephi opens his heart a little bit to us as the readers of his words. And he, he shares a little bit of a concern in verse 1. He says, Now I, Nephi, cannot write all the things which were taught among my people, neither am I mighty in writing, like unto speaking. I don't know about you, but how many times have you opened up first or second Nephi and thought to yourself, wow, you know, Nephi's not a great writer, but we'll, we'll work our way through this book. I've never had that thought. But Nephi feels inadequate. Nephi doesn't feel like he's measuring up in this particular role as a prophet in the writing aspect of his prophetic mantle. He's saying, when we speak... When a, when a person speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. But he's saying basically, I don't feel like the same thing's happening when I write. And he's kind of lamenting his, his inability to express his emotions and his thoughts the same way. Now, very quickly, he's speaking Hebrew. But he's writing in Egyptian characters, so he's having to do some sort of a translation. And any of you who speak a foreign language, you know how stifling that can feel when you have all these things inside, you want to just share them, but you can't. I love this verse because what it shows me in the, the uh, sum total of First and Second Nephi is that God is able to take your best effort even if it doesn't look very good to you, even if you, you feel lacking, you're, you're saying, oh, I, I, can't, I can't say what I want to say. The point is, say what you can say and then leave the rest in the hands of the Lord and let Him magnify that offering. I can't tell you how many times in the mission field, in those early days of struggling with, with learning Portuguese, and wanting, wanting to teach so badly what I felt, and I didn't have the words. So I used what simple words and phrases I did know to try to communicate, and used hand gestures and facial expressions, and somehow, some way, when the need was there, the Lord made up the difference with the power of the Holy Ghost. And I think we're seeing that in a... a incredible, miraculous way with the Book of Mormon that the Lord is magnifying Nephi's written words to the point where they move us incredibly when we read them. And 
you'll notice that he said the Holy Ghost carries the message unto the heart when a speaker speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, but he didn't say the Holy Ghost carries it into the heart. It just unto the heart. That's interesting. When a teacher or a speaker does their job, does their role, the Holy Ghost can bring the message unto. But I, as the learner, have to open my heart for the Holy Ghost to let it sink in, or I have to turn it over to the Savior to, to have him soften my heart and open it for the Holy Ghost to, to, to carry that message deep into my soul. And that's, that's an interesting thing to think about when you, when you think about that understanding correct doctrine and principles and how it changes our behavior. How does understanding that change you as a teacher going into a setting? Um, no longer for me, no longer am I worrying about, oh, you know, am I going to be able to reach so-and-so or am I going to be able to reach so-and-so or, or even as a parent in a family home evening or other settings that we find ourselves in. Now I'm, again, relying wholly upon the Savior to do that part. He's going to work with them. And what I'm going to work on doing is just getting as close in line with the Savior as I can. And, and I'm going to try and teach what he wants me to teach, say what he wants me to say, um, comfort as he wants me to comfort, counsel as he wants me to counsel with the Spirit, again, as that companion. And then I'm going to trust him. I'm going to relax about the end result and give that to him and let him work with the people in softening and opening their hearts as they work with him for that word to then enter into their hearts. In verse 3, Nephi gives us this, this beautiful indication here at the beginning. He says, but I, Nephi, have written what I have written, and I esteem it as of great worth, and especially unto my people. I love that. After explaining how I'm, I'm not a, as good of a writer as I am a, a speaker, but then he drops it at the Savior's feet. He says, I've written what I've written, and I esteem it as a great worth unto, unto my people. And then he goes on to say, For I pray continually for them by day, and mine eyes water my pillow by night because of them. And I cry unto my God in faith, and I know that he will hear my cry. I think this really gives us a glimpse into the soul of a prophet not just mm -hmm. Nephi, but, but all of God's prophets, our current prophet today, especially when speaking of my people, his people, he says, I pray continually for them by day and my eyes water my pillow by night. I can, I can see that. I can picture that. Uh, the, the responsibility and the weight I even feel it as a parent in this little tiny microcosm, you know, that responsibility and that weight. And, and I pray continually for, for the ones within my stewardship and my care. And my tears do water my pillow at night for them um, and in behalf of them. And then you, you, you think of a prophet's role, all of God's children, um, and the responsibility and the weight that, that those prophets carry. And... And yet, where is the focus? I pray continually for my people, and my eyes water my pillow by night because of them. Not because of me. Not because this is hard and I don't want to do this, or it's, 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 a, it's a tough job, but my eyes water my pillow because of them. And in verse 4, Nephi says, I know that the Lord will consecrate my prayers for the gain of my people. It, it, it's... it's so Christ-like what a prophet does. They, they, they serve and they love and they teach even when it's not popular and it's not fun and, and it's maybe not going well at times. And yet they just keep giving and giving and giving aligned with, with the Savior. And to me, one of the, the take-home principles here is we know that the prophets and, and the apostles and the other leaders of the church and their families that they're doing this for us. Kind of the, the question that comes to my mind is, to what degree are we doing the same thing 
for them and for each other. Because they're, they're like you said, they're showing this Christ-like example and you know that they're praying for us. How much are we really sustaining them and praying for them is, is a question worth asking. So after Nephi tells us these different groups of people that he has charity for, his people, the Jews, the Gentiles, then he, then he gives this invitation and he repeats it three times in verse 10. Now my beloved brethren and also Jew and all the ends of the earth, those three groups that we talked about that he has charity for. Now he calls us our, his beloved brethren. Hearken unto these words and believe in Christ. And if you will believe not in these words, believe in Christ. And if you shall believe in Christ, you will believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ, and he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. Brothers and sisters, Belief in Christ is not something that we sit back and wait to hit us or to, to fall upon us or to, to engulf, us, engulf us. Belief in Christ, to believe in Christ is a choice that we can make and we don't need to wait for next year to make it. We can make it right now. I'm going to believe in Jesus Christ. I'm going to more than ever before give him my life, give him my love, and give him my loyalty. I'm going to do my best to, to have these experiences to move forward, keeping his commandments, which he has given, and, and to, to fulfill all of those covenantal opportunities that he offers us, those connecting points with him. So now let's jump to the very last verse and skip down to the very last phrase that this incredible prophet Nephi writes for us as he, as he signs off, as he bids us farewell. He says, For thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. It's part of that choosing to believe in Christ is to learn what commandments God has given me and obey. Don't you love the fact that Nephi's final substantive word before his amen is obey. Most people would refer to him as Mr. Obedience. But if Nephi were standing here today, I don't think he would say, I am Mr. Obedience. I think he would simply say, I was doing everything I could to pattern my life after Jesus Christ. To not just believe in him, not just have a foundation of correct doctrinal belief, but to put it into practice so that my life would reflect his. Nephi, I think, would say, I'm not Mr. Obedience. Jesus Christ is the perfect example of he who obeyed perfectly in all things, at all times, and in all places. And I was simply trying to be more like him. So now to finish this episode, let's now go back and pick up one of my all-time favorite verses of Scripture. It's verse 6. Nephi says, I glory in plainness. I glory in truth. I glory in my Jesus, for he hath redeemed my soul from hell. The thing I love about this is that Nephi chose to use the personal pronoun my. He didn't say, I glory in Jesus or I glory in the Savior or the Redeemer. He didn't speak about Jesus Christ in generic terms. He spoke about him in a more covenantally connected way. I glory in my Jesus. You see, it's never been in question as to who claims us. The Savior claims us as his own, my people. He uses that personal pronoun with us all the time. And now Nephi is using that personal pronoun to reciprocate. We are all wrapped in the arms of safety, in the arms of love, in the arms of grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. That's never been in question. God's love for us, it's not a question. The only thing that's in question 
has been and still remains our love for him. And so here it's this opportunity for us to, to enfold him back in the arms of our love and our acceptance. That is what that covenantal belonging looks like. It's, it's to not have the, the embrace be one-sided, but to glory in my Jesus. I know from my own personal experience that Jesus loves us. I know that those arms are real of love and mercy um, and power. And I know that we can trust him wholly. We can rely on him wholly and completely. And he is mighty to save. Um, he is mighty to save whatever the challenges that you are facing in your life right now. The Savior's arms of mercy and love and power are mighty to save you. I also know that that, that saving isn't just in a general, broad sense um, of the Savior of all mankind, but He is my Savior. He is your Savior. And that's a very personal and intimate saving that happens not just on the infinite level, but on a very individual level how your Savior loves you. And we testify of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved.